have a yeah. call. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Deanna West Torrance, and I'm the Executive Director of North End Community Improvement Collaborative. Thank you very much for coming down and joining us. Um, this is actually, many of you are here um, the second Wednesday of every month for the Citizen Action Sector meetings, and this is our regular meeting time. And so this month, um, the group thought that it would be good to ask our city council candidates to join us for a, for a forum. So we're have a different format for our normal meeting. Um, I wanted to first um, just tell you a little bit about the citizen action sector. I'm going to be very brief. I'm going to tell you right now that we're on an extremely tight schedule. We have a lot of questions and um, so Jean will be keeping time and I'll introduce all the folks in just a second. So first of all the citizen action is a sector uh, it is an RCDG sector and it was formed between um, the beautification sector which was led by Doug Gersall and me the neighborhood sector or, uh, we both can be in those two sectors and as we were talking about beautification in neighborhoods what kept coming up over and over again was code enforcement and so for a long time we called ourselves the code enforcement pod but we didn't like how that sounded so uh, this group typically has uh, several agencies represented that deal with housing and, and um, social services. So Catholic Charities is, is a regular attendee, ESOP is a regular part of this group, uh, regional planning, um, the health department, the library, any CIC, and various departments within the city, codes and permits, um, and the law director's office. Our regular attendees of this. We are not a formal group, but those are the folks who show up often. We also have a quite a number of council people who attend the meetings as well. And the whole purpose of this committee and this group, what we have focused on primarily is blight. And so Matt uh, Work, I'm going to call him so he can start making his way up here. He's our Director of Environmental Health with the Health Department. Um, I just have asked him if he could very briefly Talk about some of the work that's in the citizen action sector, the types of things that we're doing here. And that is as much for the candidates as it is for the audience. Um, we are a group that has worked a lot with city government. And so this will be kind of a different type of forum in the sense that we're looking a lot at process. We're looking at how you all are going to work with outside people and how you're going to work with the public. So a lot of our, our questions are going to take that angle as opposed to what's your solution for this or that. So um, we, we, most of the people in the audience have attended those citizen action meetings and so they're kind of familiar with the types of things. Um, and I've met with almost, talked to almost all of you um, at some point about that. So I am done for the evening. This is the last time you see me until we wrap up. I'm gonna hand it over to Matt Work. He's the Director of Environmental Health. Matt's going to talk about um, some of the work that the citizen action sector has done. And then from there, he will introduce our moderators and they will then introduce our panel. So thank you. Without Deanna's efforts and uh, NECIC, uh, a lot of this wouldn't happen. Um, I got involved with citizen action sector in about 2011 uh, when I was invited. And uh, as she said, we've had a lot of different officials here. We've got city and county officials. We've had a lot of uh, the citizens I see here that have come to our meetings and given us some of our our ideas, uh, which basically uh, around problems that everybody's facing. Um, the most recurring issue was the difficulty we found in reporting problems. One of the reoccurring things we kept hearing is, you know, how do I report this problem? Who do I report it to? What happens to that complaint after I do it? How do I find out what's going on? Why is it still a problem a year and a half later? You know, so we did we did invite a lot of, of city and county officials to try to answer some of those questions. We had some very good brainstorming sessions, and one of the things that came out of that was that we talked about the fact that uh, possibly a central intake system. A uh, central intake system was an idea that uh, we have floated, and the idea was is that anybody could call in and complain to one number and. That committee actually was made up of NECIC. Uh, we had city employees. We had first call 211 from the library, regional planning, neighborhood watch, and a law director's office. And what we did is we looked at the viability of, of that central intake system as a number that you could call 211, or you could use a website, you could post your complaint. 
and it would automatically get routed to the department or the departments you need to go to. And then the next thing was that you could file that ticket and see what happened with that complaint. Uh, one of the things we had to, to tell people, and one of the big problems is vacant properties, which I'll talk about a little bit too. Well, with vacant property, we run into this problem both at the city level, the county level, and the health department level, where uh, we have property that is basically somebody walked away from it three years ago. The bank never took control of it. But meanwhile, we have a, a problem with a house that may have garbage in it. We've had houses with tires put in them. Uh, we've had problems with uh, uh, broken out windows. They're obviously an attractive nuisance. They're a safety issue. They're not fun to watch at, at your, your a neighbor. So, um, you know, that, that was something that we had to sort of explain that the problem was is that nobody owns those properties. So the one thing we looked at was, well, that, that's another problem. And what we talked about was vacant uh, registration, vacant property registration. And we looked at some of the cities in Ohio, and there's actually, I just got a, a new uh, study that actually has a lot more information about vacant land registration or vacant lot registration. It could be housing, it could be housing and lots, it could be any combination. But more and more people start doing when we start going through the bankruptcies and the foreclosures in the uh, mid-2000s. Uh, mid uh, so uh, that was when we looked at Euclid and Euclid had actually come up with a plan and they proposed a $200 fee. And so if you had a vacant property, you would register that property that generated money to help maintain those properties. And the other thing was is that it made banks take possession of some of these properties. So instead of having a property that's in limbo, and uh, Bard Hamilton, the treasurer's office can't do anything, the health department can't do anything, codes and permits can't do anything if we don't have an owner. You know, somebody's moved off to Texas and the bank says, well, it's not mine, they legally can't fix that problem. So that was one thing that we also looked at was vacant registration. Uh, in that light, the city actually has J.R. Rice over to Codes and Permits working on indexing and coming up with a vacant property list. And I did talk to J.R. and what he did come up with is that right now his best estimate is between eight and 12,000 properties. Um, now I take that back. I think it was 4,000 to 8,000 at least. corrected on that. Uh, that are vacant in the city of Mansfield alone. You know, so he's cross-indexing that with gas records, electric records, et cetera, to try to come up with that list. So that, that is coming along, uh, but that is something that we haven't resolved is, is that's something that we move forward with as a vacant registration program. Um, the last thing I really want to mention is we talked about city codes in Sorry, general. I have a question. Is that all properties, commercial included, or is that just residential? Residential is what he was looking at. Thank you. Sorry. And uh, JR, apologize, he couldn't make it tonight. So, so hopefully I'm not saying something that he'll, he'll make me regret. <laughs> <laughs> uh, last thing I want to tell about the city codes, they have a very limited staff. I've worked with them for five years now. A very limited budget. Their personnel have actually been cut back. They don't have enough people to do the job that we need for a city of 44,000 people. Uh, the other thing is the housing codes are old, in many cases they're outdated. So these are some of the problems we're facing that, you know, as a health department and as a citizen of Mansfield, what I'm looking at is long-term direction of, of a, a defining priorities basically and then figuring a, a game plan on how we're going to do that. So with that I'm going to hush and I'll introduce our moderators. First off is Scott Zartman, Neighborhood Watch. He has uh, been one of our uh, people at our central intake and very staunch supporter of our group for Citizen Action Center. <coughs> and Leona Smith with NECIC. I'll turn over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Leona Smith, and I am the office manager here at NECIC. At this time, we are going to allow all of the candidates to give a brief introduction of themselves. And we also ask that they share with the audience their top three priorities as council men and women, as well as how they plan to prepare for the position that they're seeking. We're going to start in alphabetical order from our right with Ms. Okay. I don't know if I need the mic. Do you, can you hear me? I'm so used to speaking loud. Anyway, I am Cindy Baker. I am running for council at large. 
I recently retired after 36 years with the City of Mansfield uh, in the Community Development Department. My three key issues, the reason why I'm running is community revitalization, safety, and constituent service, which is more like public service. Uh, how I plan to put things into plan for is working with neighborhood organizations. I plan on working with the safety forces, but in order to do anything about revitalization, we need nonprofit organization group, whether it's housing, social service, senior citizen groups. We need to band together to get some of these issues resolved. I know as a past employee, city, hall, city building, city government, city funds cannot do everything. You cannot eradicate some of the problems that's been here for years. So uh, with my experience with working with federal funds and social services, I think if we band together and work on some of these issues, we can turn Mansfield around. I am not one that sit back and complain or not get in, involved, so that's why I am involved. Rather than sitting back, uh, watching the city uh, actually deteriorating in some areas that already deteriorated and to put this kind of impact on the city is like someone needs to step up, come to the, the forefront and work on these issues. Not only when it comes to our kids' safety, our senior safety, but we as individual citizens. If we can work together to resolve some of these issues, and that's why I am moving forward, uh, seeking your vote in November. Well, I don't think I talk as loud as Cindy. So <laughs> oh, yeah. No, that's a blessing. It really is. My name is Pat Hightower, and I've been a member of council for about eight and a half years. And the reason, the one reason I'm still seeking it is because I, there's a need. And my, my format has always been, what can I do to help someone? Sometimes you can't do it, but you can be the person that can point them in the right direction. In the city of Mansfield, we know that without funds now, everything is uh, it's not as it was uh, eight years ago. Uh, the blessing I have is that NECIC is a part of the fifth ward. And uh, with organizations like NECIC and what they do, can you hear me? Uh, Mm -hmm. Is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, uh, one of the blessings of NECIC and what they do is it's just what Ms. Baker was talking about. The city can't do it by itself. It, 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 it's almost impossible. The funds are not there. So we have to be a part of helping one another to see what is needed and what we can do. Uh, I can remember uh, when there was a problem with garbage and weeds and it was NECIC that sent several people they had employed to come up here, and that was like a year ago. And they, well, a year and a half ago. And, and they had them cut down a lot of weeds. It's with organizations, each one helping one another. That's how we're going to get the job done. Thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm Cliff Mears. Um, I'm currently city council at large. Uh, I took over when Doug Bursoff resigned uh, last June. Okay. Um, my priorities for the city are number one, make Mansfield a safer place for everybody. Okay. Because if you're not safe, nothing else matters, in my opinion. That's got to be number one. And I think we're making progress in that respect. We're well understaffed, but as you will recall, we had five officers sworn in last month. That's a start. We've got a long way to go. Uh, my priority number two is providing opportunities for citizens and their children. And this really touches my heart because I see so many people, including myself, who raised their children in Mansfield, 
educate their children in Mansfield, and then what? There are limited opportunities. So what do they do? They have to leave. Our children have to leave, and that degrades the family. I love my kids. I wish my kids were in town, but you know what? There are limited opportunities. So what we need to do is generate more jobs. Everybody says that. My background is in business and finance. I've worked with some of the largest uh, companies in, in the country. As a matter of fact, uh, Westinghouse is the company that brought me down here. I was working on my MBA at the University of Toledo. That's how long ago, you know, how long I've been in town. I was brought down here for Westinghouse. But I've worked with Redline Healthcare, General Motors, uh, Ontario <coughs> C-Tech. Uh, I used to do the uh, distribution for National Geographic, as well as Smithsonian Institute when I worked with R.R. Donnelly and Willard. So my background is in business and finance. And you can talk about uh, government spending money judiciously, but it's another thing to talk about generating money getting money in town, generating more money for government to spend. That's where my strength is, you know? Um, when I was, uh, you know, when you're in a particular occupation, and my, my career has been very varied, fortunately, God bless, you know? I've been able to do a lot of things with a lot of different organizations. And when I worked with um, the National Geographic, as I mentioned, in their national distribution of the case found books, you know, when, when you're in any kind of trade or profession, you get magazines and trade journals, right? Well, there was a logistics and traffic and distribution trade journal that I read when I was running for this office in 2007. I made this, this point at that time. That there was a study done for potential distribution centers across the United States. And the survey was done based on geographical proximity to population centers, density of population, rail service, uh, length of runways, width of runways, infrastructure, access to major thoroughfares, access to, to turnpikes. And based on all these metrics, do you know where Mansfield landed across the country? Number one in 2007. Now I checked recently, we're still in the top 10, but we've got a lot of uh, options. We've got a lot of, uh, I think, resources that we can optimize that I think we need to do. And that's, that's what my background is. So again, the second priority is generating more revenue, gener generating more jobs, and making Mansfield a more attractive community for businesses to commit. Uh, and number three is making Mansfield more business friendly. Uh, what, gener what, what energizes me is knocking on a lot of doors and hearing from people, understanding uh, you know, what their concerns are, and helping to mediate those things. Uh, and I've been very successful in that respect. My undergraduate degree is in communication, communication skills. Uh, I taught for 20 years uh, as adjunct faculty at North Central State College. Before that, I taught at the University of Toledo, teaching communication skills. And exactly what you've heard at this podium a few minutes ago really boils down to communication. You know, the NECIC works with Catholic charities, I saw Sammy yesterday on uh, the area agency on aging. You know, that's another group. You know, but these are just, these are uh, communication factors. These are groups that we get together to learn what the issues are, to understand what the issues are, and work with them. And that's where I see my role as being a conduit for people um, <coughs> at large within the community to tell me what your problems are. Let me try to muster the resources. Let me work with the administration, and let me help solve your problem. That's what energizes me, and those are what my priorities are. Priorities are and that's uh, where I think uh, my strengths are. Thank you much. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jamie Thompson. I am a candidate for Third Ward City Council. Thank you for having me here today. I appreciate the invitation. Um, I have been uh, affiliated with Downtown Mansfield Incorporated for the past 12 years uh, in one capacity or another, currently as the co-director. I chose to run for this office because I believe my strengths uh, in networking and working in a collaborative effort with all of the leaders and past administrations in the city of Mansfield will allow me to provide an audience to the constituents in this ward. Um, I believe that it is very important to continue to focus on the positive uh, aspects of our community. I think often we uh, become bogged down in what is the negative and honestly our community is it, it's fantastic. Um, I also look to provide our constituents with an opportunity to better the war that we are in and uh, eradicate the blight that we have <coughs> faced and we currently face and to continue to look for new development, positive development, whether that is in an economic capacity, uh, public capacity, or a private capacity. Uh, thank you very much for having me here today. I great, greatly appreciate the time to uh, uh, come to this this meeting. I was my name is John Van Harligan, and I'm currently running for the third ward council. And I was born and raised in Mansfield. I've lived here all my life. Graduated from Malabar High School. 
I'm married to my wife, Jill, for 18 years. Several sons, daughter, well, stepson, daughter, daughter-in-law, nieces, nephews, what have you. I retired from the city of Mansfield in 2009 after 33 plus years of service. My campaign is based very simply on not promises, no smoke and mirrors. Having worked for the city for three years, my campaign is based on experience, knowledge, and ability. First, my experience, I have been in several different departments of the city of Mansfield. I was always an asset and brought something to that department. I was never afraid of a challenge. The knowledge I have, it's all carried from the different departments I've worked in. I have first-hand, uh, excuse me, first-hand daily knowledge of the operations of the city. I saw, I also have a strong working knowledge of the administrative, not to mention the legislative branch of the city. The city is also <coughs> governed underneath the uh, Charter Commission, which I am also very familiar and aware of. Each of these, each of these branches have their own purpose and their reason, and we have to abide by them. After the years I've been involved in the planning and implementation of several projects and programs and I've never turned down a project or a challenge. I was always there. There has never been any concern or question during my years with the city, either from the administration or from the public, and a lot of my duties were public related, that I didn't answer the question promptly and professionally. Rarely was there a problem where they had to go over my head. My ability very simple, full time. It's not a part time job to me. I know the issues that the Mansfield is facing today is going to take more than a meeting or two, and it's not going to be handled in those meetings. Somebody has to get out there and work on it. <clears throat> there are several topics and discussions from many years ago that we are facing today. They're a little, they're a little more serious today than they were back years ago. I know I, I worked with past administrations when it came to uh, the abandoned housing, the slums of blight. Well, now it's a major, major issue. And that has to be a major concern with the city. Not to mention our finances. I do believe we have to get our core, we have to work with the city first as the core to get our finances back in order. And that has been coming where we're dealing with our third administration now. We do have the state auditors in town, and the sooner we can be rid of them, and I'm saying this in a nice way because they're not here because they want to be, the sooner we can get back on our feet and address the issues with the city, the better. And I do look forward to those days. The, the, life, the expectations of the city has been threatened. We know that. But with sound, leadership, excuse me, with sound leadership and decisions, the city will survive and return to what the citizens expect. I support our, our safety forces 100% under the conditions. I find it amazing they have, the, they have the ability to accomplish as much as they have. Our service departments can also be, or be credited for doing such a fantastic job. When I was in the service departments, there was a lot more employees. They're doing a great job with what they're doing today. The number one, a big major concern is the jobs for Mansfield. I can't promise jobs, but I know, but I will promise this. The city's economic development director, along with the other highly qualified individuals and organizations in this area have my full support, not part-time, full-time. And I give you my word on that. And this young lady's got her little card up there, and I could go on a few more, but I'll, I'll just leave it there. <laughs> Anyways, thank you for your support, and I appreciate being here today. Okay, I would like to thank all of the candidates for sharing their views and opinions. Um, now we can just dig a little deeper. We do have some questions that we have prepared that stem from our Citizen Action meeting that we will have the candidates address. Um, and the first one being, when looking at the various forms of communication available, how do you personally plan to communicate, poll, and interact with your constituents and your fellow council members? And also, what do you feel is a reasonable amount of time for a response? And this time, we can start from the far left with Mr. Clinton. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I love communication. That, that's my field. That's my background. That's what I studied for so long. Uh, gosh, where do I start? 
Yeah, I guess to answer the, the, the question, what what forum, what format is best? <coughs> you got to go face to face. You got to make numbers. You got to talk to people. I mean, when you have that one on one dyadic communication, that's where understanding really happens, in my opinion. Uh, I love to knock on doors. I mentioned a few minutes ago that that's what energizes me. I've had good success with that. Uh, you know, I, I was knocking on doors recently, and, and to follow up on a comment that was made earlier, you know, we really have some excellent administrators. Uh, I was talking to a, an individual who had a who was concerned about flood damage that, that's happened from time to time within his in his, in his home, and, and this was I was on his porch and we're talking about this. He said, you know, the city. They're starting to, to uh, do some work across the street, and I'm concerned that they're going to undo what was already done because they corrected it once, but now we're going to redirect the drainage. So at 10:45 last Sunday, I sent an email to Bob Bianchi, the city engineer. I got an email back at a quarter to 12, almost midnight. I will be at this gentleman's home tomorrow before noon. I'll walk him through what we plan to do. I'll show them the materials that we're going to use, and I'll go over the timeline with him. That doesn't happen on Facebook. That doesn't happen on emails, you know. The the end of the the, the the task did, but the true understanding really has to be face to face, and that's what I think is most important. Um, what, was the first <laughs> the issue? what do you feel is a reasonable amount of time to respond? Well, in this case, it happened almost instantaneously. I mean, you know, within moments, we got a commitment for the city to come out. But you know, this is this is the kind of response. That, that, uh, that we're getting from uh, the people that are anxious to serve, the, the people in the administration. And I think, you know, we're, we're on the right track, and we've got a lot of work to do, but, uh, you know, the, the comment was made a minute ago that, you know, we really need to get our, our finances in order, and that's absolutely true. We, we do have a long way to go. Um, but uh, we, we do have now a budget stabilization plan that was recently introduced and voted on and approved by council, which allows the city, you know, when we have problems, uh, to, to be able uh, to use the phrase to weather the storm, you know, yeah, when we have problems, if a business moves out, some kind of a uh, you know, natural disaster occurs, we have the funds to, to maintain an even keel. So we're making progress. A lot more has to be done. But again, you know, face to face is really the way to go for me, and uh, that, that's, in my opinion, what's, what works best. You know, it, it takes a lot of evenings, it takes a lot of commitments, it takes weekends. Uh, but you know what? We do have a lot of media. Um, you know, we have a lot of technology that we're able to, to optimize these days, which you couldn't do 10 years ago. But, you know, face-to-face -face is number one, and then the others are supplements. So uh, I think that's the true understanding and true resolution of problems happens. Okay? Thank you. For me, communication happens in a variety of ways. Face-to-face, uh, -face, absolutely. Um, with the advent of many forms of technology, I think that information can be uh, obtained immediately. Um, I am a firm believer in social media, cell phones, photos, taking pictures, shooting those pictures off as far as emails to uh, departments that are aware and in, need to be aware of what issues are faced. Um, in my capacity downtown, I find myself taking photos of things that are happening, for instance, uh, at the municipal lot at 4th and Diamond right now. We have a situation where there are about uh, a stack of five large cement blocks that just appeared out of nowhere. Um, taken a photo of them, sent it over to engineering and safety services, and uh, have been following up with them to see that those are removed. Um, I will continue to work in those same formats, whether that is face-to-face, -face, online, through a cell phone, email, Facebook, to receive constituent concerns. Um, as far as a turnaround time on getting those fixed, I think that that's really dependent upon the issue at hand. Um, I think what's most important is not letting them go. Um, it's up to us as council folks and administrators and leaders to maintain and be engaged in whatever needs to be fixed. I think it's very easy to identify a problem, send the problem off to someone else, and then let it go. And um, I don't typically let things go. I tend to follow through and intend to continue to follow through. So the ways that I would deal with um, issues would be to have them come to me in a variety of ways, whether that's face-to-face, -face, online, email, phone calls and then make sure that they continue to be followed up with whatever party uh, is involved in that process. Um, I do know that this uh, group was looking to have a streamlined process to have that information travel to the city. I think that was a, a huge benefit and could have been hugely effective. I know it has been effective in other communities and it's something that I would be supportive to see move forward. Depends on how the people contact me. 
I would get back to them as quickly as possible, whether it be on the telephone, handwritten letter, email, doesn't matter, whatever it takes. Uh, during my travels here in the past few weeks, talking to different people in the neighborhoods, I am finding a lot of elderly people that are not savvy with the technology we have today. And so it's real simple, a phone call or a knock on the door. If that's what I gotta do, that's what I'm gonna do. Uh, yeah, it, it's a lot easier with emails and what have you, but there's, past years it was so much easier dealing especially with the elderly that you just had to go see them. It made it a lot easier. As for where the complaint and the problem may lay and where what has to be done, I don't have a problem with that. My past, my past, it was it could be a codes and permits, could be a health department, it could be it could be any number of things that we do have options available. But I feel you have to get back with the people and let them know what's going on. You don't leave people hanging. That's not right. So as for a timeline on on how things, how fast they proceed and get done, well, it just depends on what you're dealing with. And I'm not afraid to uh, follow up and push a little bit if that need be, which sometimes it is, because unfortunately, a lot of a lot of areas in this city today is understaffed. So I don't want to be a pain. I just want to let them know I'm there. Thank you. Um, I believe it's also it depends on the situation and what the person is about. For me, it's a lot of one-on-one. -on -one. I do a lot of face-to-face -face communication. And on the telephone, uh, I wouldn't recommend anyone else do, but I get in my car and say I'll be right there in, in a lot of situations because uh, I also have a lot of elderly people, and a lot of times they just want to see you. Sometimes people just want to uh, let go of what's inside, and when you understand where they're at, then it's, then it's different. And so I always say if I can help, you know, I want to be a help. Um, it depends on the situation about the, sometimes uh, people will complain and you will find out that complaint can't be handled that night or even the next day. And if you call codes and permits and God bless them because they are doing a wonderful job with the, with the limited amount of people they have there. But uh, a lot of times um, people will complain about a house and sometimes, and I would tell them, uh, in regard to looking for the owner of a house, they might not even live in the city, in the state, or even in the country. So a lot of times it, there's si different situations for every problem. Um, so the turnaround time, I try to get back to everyone. I do a lot of calling, and again, uh, I have drank a lot of coffee in a lot of kitchens, but I, I've enjoyed it all. <laughs> okay, communication. You know, in my past job with the city as the uh, community development director, one-on-one -on -one over the years has been the best remedy for whatever is going on in the communication. Being out in the neighborhood and being accessible has always worked in the past for me. Because a lot of time when you go out to take that special time and effort to go out and communicate one-on-one, -on -one, like Pat said, sitting up there drinking coffee, sometimes people just want to get things off their chest. They have complained. They have, what they said, have gotten the runaround with the city and I am a city employee and that even went for my department. Everything cannot be corrected in an hour or sometime in 24 hours. But if you have the time to get out and listen and be there for any citizen, whether it's old, young, it, it doesn't matter. But I found out that being visible, being in contact with whomever or whatever the concerns may be, I've worked with every department in the city. And due to things the way they are now with the uh, downsizing, things just don't get corrected overnight. 
there are going to be some problems. Even after the November election, there's still going to be problems. They're still going to need that turnaround time, time to get things done. But at the same time, trying to get a response time is almost impossible unless it's something that could be handled right then and there. But if it's a major issue, whether it's uh, the sewer line that broke in the street, we got a flooding problem, and the water is backing up in my basement, that is not going to be taken care of in 15 or 20 minutes. And I've heard those kind of complaints even as working as the housing director, sewer problem, water problem, electrical problem. But just being out there to deal with that issue one-on-one, -on -one, people will appreciate it and your kindness will take you farther than sometimes just uh, answering an uh, email or phone call, you have to have a personal contact. And I'm, like I say, Mansfield is my home. And I'm curious to make sure and concerned enough to be out there whenever a problem will arrive or should arrive <coughs> to take care of the issue. Thank you. Moving right along, the next question we want to address is when looking at the many issues that the city faces on a monthly or even a weekly basis, what would you say your level of commitment and availability is, and how will you incorporate working with various forms of outside agencies and citizens in solving community-wide problems? We'll start from my right this time with Ms. Cindy Baker. The way things are monthly and weekly, Running for city council to me is not a part-time job. I am in this full-time, whenever a call comes, whether it's monthly, weekly, I'm there to give it my all in all, not just in five minutes or 10 minutes or eight hours, but if it takes all week to work on an issue, that is what I am planning on doing to get things resolved and going to city council uh, twice a month or maybe three times, it all depends on how many meetings that the committee meetings may be set up. But if you're taking on a role like this and being a voice for the people, I mean, I'm there planning on being there accessible seven days a week. I'm not one to give my cell phone out generally to the public, but since I've been during this campaign, my cell phone number is all over this city. So it's not like calling city council and it's being directed to someone else. I'm going to be accessible, so you can call me. Uh, I feel once you're elected uh, to a public office, maybe you have a certain platform that gets you there, or you're a Democrat or Republican, <clears throat> excuse me, but I do believe once you're elected, everyone has to work together. That's the only way we're ever going to get anything done. We all work together. Whatever the issue is, we come together. Can we disagree? Absolutely. We value each other's opinions, but we must come together and work together. As far as uh, uh, working with other agencies, is that the question? Other agencies? Yes, I, I have been in contact with different agencies, went to different their meetings. Um, I've been to the area of aging. I even went to Catholic Charity and, and asked questions there out of Salvation Army because they all have a way of helping. And what they do, they help the citizens of the city you represent. So you want to be a part of knowing if a person says, I need this, then you can say, I know there, there is help available through Catholic Charities, Salvation Army, or Area and Aging. Real simple. I'm in it full time. I have the hours and I'm flexible. There's absolutely no problem. Uh, past years, I've attended many meetings that would have uh, would be directly or indirectly related to 
my positions or what I was doing at that time. And now I have the full time to do it. It's real simple. And I I, I have the enthusiasm. We do it until we get it done. I'm in full time. It's that simple. Thank you. Uh, I feel as though um, an opportunity to become a council representative for the third ward is really an extension of my current job. <coughs> as I stated earlier, I've been uh, affiliated with Downtown Municipal Incorporated for the past 12 years. In that role, um, I've collaborated with numerous organizations on a daily basis. Uh, I'm in uh, the city building at least once, if not twice per day, um, with different levels of administrators, police, fire, um, engineering, community development, the mayor's office. Um, I do feel that this is an extension of what I'm currently doing. Um, the ward is overlapping to some extent with downtown Mansfield. We do work heavily in the third ward at this point. Um, my cell phone number has been online and on our voicemail at downtown Mansfield for 12 years. It's not changed, it won't change, and it will continue to be a full-time career for me. Um, in dealing with the various month issues that come up monthly, weekly, you know, periodically, um, I think the best way to do that is you have to set priorities. I mean, it's easy to take these tasks, uh, tasks as a group, but unless you organize and plan and prioritize, you're not going to get things done in a timely fashion. That's been my strength in the business community in organizational process and time management. You know, as these issues come up, you've got to prioritize what are the issues that are most important and why are they most important? Uh, does it involve additional dollars? Does it involve, you know, uh, hardship on people? You need to set priorities based on what's reasonable. And then once you set those priorities, set a timeline. And when you set the timeline, confirm with the person whose problem it is that this is going to be acceptable. That's how I think you deal with the, the issues that come up daily, monthly, and weekly to get the most done, get the maximum, and optimize you know, the results that you're going to get. And in business, if you're not results oriented, you don't stay in business very well. In dealing with the various agencies, you know, that's what I've done uh, consistently. Uh, it, with council, um, as Jamie said, you know, we're, we're always dealing with engineering and finance uh, and, and, and various agencies. And I've heard the air, Area Agency on Aging come up a couple of times. Um, I have been on the Board of Trustees of the Mansfield Playhouse for more years than I can imagine, 20 some years. I'm also the business manager. I set the budgets, approve expenditures. I think it's important to keep the arts in, in Mansfield. But as part of that function, you know, we're largely a volunteer organization. Uh, I needed volunteers for one point where uh, you know, we, we had a shortfall, and I dealt with the area, area Agency on Aging at Chapel. Cassie Cutlass Mills, and I said, hey, you know, do you have some retired people that have some time available that could help us out, perpetuate the arts, and you know what? You get to see the show for free. You know? And they really they enjoyed that. Uh, so we, we worked out a partnership. Uh, actually, their, their insurance was paid while they're commuting back and forth, so there's no risk in helping uh, you know, our organization. They loved to see the show, and it actually worked out pretty well. There were a lot of people that wanted to get involved that, uh, you know, um, don't have a lot of either they're retired, they don't have a lot of, a lot of other outside activities and interests, and this gave them something to do uh, and, and help, again, perpetuate the arts. And since, hey, we're the fun center of Ohio, that's what we need to do, right? Uh, the arts are very important to me. Uh, I think it's, it's important as council people in dealing with the agencies, because really our function is a facilitator. We're the conduit. We need to understand people's problems and, and, do, and identify and muster the right resources. Once we prioritize, once we understand what needs to be done and set a timeline, it's dealing with the agencies because each agency has their niche, you understand. The area agency on aging is dealing with the concerns of older people, and in this case, that niche helped us out, both the individual and the organization. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, my name is Scott Zartman. I'm uh, the representative from the neighborhood watch groups, from citywide groups, and for uh, actually Ward 3. Um, one of the things that we came up with is uh, we decided to present a, a scenario that was um, established through the video that was the tale of two neighbors. And that was actually view viewable online to the NECIC website as well as we sent each candidate one of those videos. So our scenario in, in this uh, presentation here is, is, can you describe in your own words what the fight's like? And then if you describe to us what are some of the actions that you plan to take 
uh, in addressing blighted conditions across the city and how you plan on implementing that. Uh, well, that's right down my alley. <laughs> According to the federal regulations on blight, blight is decay. It is deterioration that cannot be fixed. Uh, when it comes to neighborhood blight, that all depends if you're talking housing, commercial, building, uh, neighborhood blight could be two, three, even one house and that neighborhood or on that block that is deteriorating or it is vacant and abandoned and it is in dire needs of repairs. And if those repairs are not addressed in a timely manner, that decay and blight spreads throughout the neighborhood. Um, how would I deal with blight? This is something we tried to start years ago in community development, working with city council and Mayor Reed. We were trying to concentrate one block at a time, but due to the finances that we were getting to address this problem, which came from the Department of HUD, there is a strong dissension when it comes to what would be spent in this area, what would be spent two neighborhoods over. There is a area or a time frame that you need to sit down and concentrate. If you have housing organization that could take on some of the load, but without the funds, it's not going to address the problem. Uh, most housing organizations do not have a large budget and neither do the city anymore. So my suggestion to that is that there need to be um, collaboration with groups, organizations, not just housing groups, but businesses that could step up to the plate and, you know, if it's a men's club, you know, they can come in and work with organizations to eradicate uh, blight. It's going to take a lot of money, a lot of effort, and uh, to put our neighborhoods back where they need to be uh, to get rid of blight. Um, it's going to take a citywide effort. Citywide, not just one area, citywide. <laughs> What does blight look like to me? It, it looks like different things in different neighborhoods. Because one neighborhood could have one house, another neighborhood could have several houses, but it's still blight. Uh, how do we address the, uh, the problem uh, with the issue of the city and, and a lot of cities not having the financial uh, uh, money to go forth with a lot of things. We thank God for the federal money that's been coming forth. In the city of Mansfield, I believe, if, if I'm correct, and you can help me, Sam and Garnetta, I think we had how many 40 something houses we have torn down within the last two to three months, if I'm not mistaken. Um, it takes care of the problem, but what happens if you drive around the city, you will notice where a house has been demolished. At the next year, it's got a lot of weeds. It's, mm -hmm. it's a, a, a vacant lot that no one is taking care of. And so I believe that uh, they talk about land banks. So there is a person even on West Fifth Street, a wonderful young man, and he takes care of the property. It's not his, but he is taking care of that property because it's adjacent to his. So maybe with the land banks or making sure that if there's a house next to you to give the, the, the homeowner and the, the neighbor the opportunity to be able to purchase that or be able to take care of it, there, there's got to be something so that it would bring a lot of pride back into a, a lot of the, the neighborhoods where there was blight. Blight, uh, structurally unsafe, beyond repairs, cost prohibitive. Um, 
And these, this is basically one of the things that I had talked about a little earlier. We had a problem. We have had a problem in the city of Mansfield. And the administration had tried to address this problems more than once. And it always, it always boils down to the same thing, funding. Well, okay, the, the economy in 2008, 2009 sure didn't help matters. Talking to people, I understand that there's landlords out there that are renting houses. They're just taking every nickel and dime they can get, leaving the house fall. Once, uh, once the house is no longer livable, then they just give it back to the city. So there's a lot of little concerns that goes along with blight. There's been several concerns discussed in the past about there may be an area where at least 50% of the housing stock should come down and it follows, falls under those qualifications. Over in this neighborhood, it should only maybe be a house or two. With limited funds, what do you do? Do you try to save this neighborhood or do you create a new neighborhood? These are hard issues, folks, and we got to deal with it. It's not the first time I've heard it, and I don't have a magic crystal ball, but this is something that the city really has to deal with. I'm glad we're getting our factories these old structures torn down. I'm very happy about that. That is huge. That is a city block all in one shot. But then again, you don't have neighbors living right next to next door to these areas either. We have people that live next to these houses and they want them gone and I can appreciate that. So with money and funds available, grant wherever, wherever it can be funded, it's something we have to address not going to stop tomorrow. It's going to be an ongoing problem. But today it's serious. Thank you. Simply, I feel that uh, blight is neglect. Um, since 2008, I have been lobbying city and county officials on uh, different strategies that are happening at the state level, uh, land banking foreclosure activities. Um, the organization that I work with, last year we employed close to 250 volunteers over a four month period of time to collect 300 bags of trash in different neighborhoods that surround downtown. I think that um, when you look to the resources that we have at hand, whether that's human resources in the matter of volunteers to continue to remove trash, um, whether that is looking at stakeholders that are in neighborhoods that we reside in to assist in the process. Um, I worked with Mid Central Administration they were very concerned about a number of properties that had been uh, torn down or neglected in their neighborhood, and that administration offered to mow those properties surrounding them. So I think that you look for private, public, and nonprofit collaborations to strengthen what we have. Um, it's a very hot issue right now. There is a lot of funding that looks like it will come forward from the state level. I think it's important for local leadership to continue to investigate and employ those strategies so we are at the forefront of the opportunity. Um, I do know that the county is close to launching their land banking program, which would allow individuals who have interest in taking a uh, property that is demolished or blighted and potentially owning it for very little cost and maintaining it and assisting that neighborhood in strengthening itself. So I do think that blight is neglect, whether it's commercial or residential, I do think that um, money is key, but it's not the only determining factor in cleaning up a neighborhood. Um, I think that you rely on those individuals that have whatever resources at hand, whether that's a little bit of a time in a trash bag or if it's a, a corporation that's willing to employ their uh, staff to mow a lawn. Um, I think it's very simple the way that we tackle it. I think it's just a matter of continuing to tackle the issue. Well, the question is twofold. Number one, what is, what is blight? And number two, what actions do we take to manage it? And you've heard a variety of definitions here, and, and I think a, a good hybrid is basically it's a cost good cost prohibitive repair that's brought about by neglect. Uh, and I will agree with my opponent that it is a citywide problem. Until recently, both of the homes on either side of mine were, uh, were vacant. One still is, and has been for I don't know, five or six years, but it is a citywide problem. Uh, following up on the video, the video brought up a number of interesting uh, actions that need to be taken. Number one is holding the owners accountable. Granted, you know, sometimes the banks relieve themselves of a responsibility and the owners are, are difficult to find. 
Um, but that needs to be number one. Find out who owns it and make them be accountable. If that doesn't work out uh, and it continues to decay, then certainly you have to look at demolition. Because we're, we're in the north end, I, I thought it might be interesting to identify some of the costs and some of the properties that have been uh, demolished. Of the 99 properties that are demolished or contracted currently to be demolished, 38 are in the north end, which is 38.4%. Of those 99 properties, $869,807 has been spent. $249,272 of that for the 38 in the north end. And that's 28.7%. So that'll give you an idea of how much of the allocation in terms of houses, in terms of dollars, are in the north end as, as compared to the others, uh, the other parts of town. Uh, you know, certainly, you know, when, when this is demolished, I, I heard a couple of, of uh, options that, are, that were mentioned, and I think the land bank is an excellent option, also brought up in the video, where adjacent property owners can, for little or, or uh, no dollars, acquire that property if they're willing to uh, to maintain, to cut the grass. And uh, that provides incentive and motivation for the neighbors to improve the neighborhood themselves. Um, certainly because they get benefit out of it. And that was brought out very, very clearly in the video, which I thought was, was very well done. Um, thank you very much. Okay, as we continue, uh, one of the things that comes up is with the funding being a major issue with our city. Uh, how well do you understand the budgetary process and what do you envision as your role in helping you identify funding opportunities as we continue moving forward with our city? Um, we'll start this time with uh, Mr. Rick. Oh, you can right down the question. <laughs> <laughs> Understanding the budgetary concerns we have, uh, I serve on the Finance Committee with uh, Sammy Dunn and Ellen Herring. Uh, we work closely with the Mayor, we work closely with the Finance Director, uh, Lynn Stewart. Um, I suppose my background is in business, business and finance. Uh, I can tell you, spreadsheets are my life, and they're what I do. Um, I think I have a very clear understanding of, of a profit and loss statement, of operating budgets. Uh, I already mentioned that I'm the business manager for the Mansfield Playhouse, and I've set their budgets and approved their expenditures for well over 20 years. Uh, working now within the city, uh, I've met individually with the mayor, met with the finance director, and numerous times with the Finance Committee, again, which is Ellen and So I think I have a pretty good understanding by immersion of uh, what the city's finances are. And also I mentioned earlier that, uh, yes, we are an economic and financial emergency as a city, and yes, we do have the state auditors in, but we're on the right track, we're making progress. I mentioned we do have a budget stabilization fund to help the city weather the storm. I think that's an excellent move forward so that, you know, uh, in your household budget, you know, I, if things are tight, things are difficult, and it's hard to set money aside. But the city is disciplined, and they're taking a very measured approach to setting money aside to make sure it doesn't get worse. That's the most important thing. And with the budget stabilization fund, I think it's going to go a long way. With the move towards making Mansfield more business friendly, and as jobs come here, we'll have more money to spend, and that'll, that'll fill the coffers even greater. Thank you. We need to look at other ways that the city can continue to generate revenue. Um, just uh, in my capacity, I'm looking at street closure forms and event forms and park reservation forms. Um, the fees to do those are very, very minimal at this time. And uh, I think that if you look at uh, comparable ways in which people hold events or close different areas in different communities, our rates are really, really inexpensive, even from a parking meter standpoint. You know, right now it's 25 cents for an hour to park, and that's really, really unheard of. So I think that the city has been extremely gracious to the citizens, and I, I don't believe that we should um, have all of those dollars generated off of their backs. But I think that it's time that maybe they look for some increases here or there and continue to run an organization that's very, very, very unique. Over the years, I have been involved in the budget budgetary process one way or another, maybe on a small scale, depending on the department with which, with which I work in. Um, I will be honest with you, they have changed, totally changed the program. So when I pulled the city's budget in the last couple weeks, uh, they, they, they made it, they've changed things a little bit. They've streamlined it. It's not so much a line item like it used to be. But it's real easy to get the answers. There's no problem there. 
So I do, I do understand the city's budget. There's no problem. I'm not afraid of that. Thank you. <laughs> well, the problem is we need money. <laughs> well, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. I'm not trying to be funny or anything. Yeah. But one of the things that have helped the city is because we have been allowed and we have had grants. Uh, grants have been a blessing to us, but they do run out. Uh, raising rates, I know we raised the park rates. It's $100 to rent the park pavilion now. Um, it's, you know, we can keep raising it, but I've heard so many complaints that if we raise it too high, people are just going to decide it's not worth it. So we must come up with something else. Is it easy? No, I'll be the first to tell you. Do we need money, finances? Yes, we do. Uh, again, we thank God for the grants that have come our way that have been uh, allowed us to keep going, but they do run out. So uh, the answer, um, we just keep praying. Honestly, <laughs> there is an answer, but I really, uh, Mr. Dunn, uh, he's one of, he's a, a great finance person, and I always talk to him. I would love to say I have the answers and I know them, but I don't. So the, what's the best thing to do? Find someone that does know the answers and ask them. And so Mr. Dunn is the person I would ask. <laughs> Understanding the budget. Yes, I do understand the city budget. As the director of the community development, I am proud to say working with federal and state budgets, the city never had any kind of findings during our audit that was detrimental to us receiving any funds. So I guess you can say we can pat ourselves on the back. That time mostly John and I worked together in my department. So yes, I am very familiar with the city budget uh, through our department. Each year you have to, sometimes it looked like every time it turned around we was redoing our budget to satisfy the finance director or the annual budget for the mayor. So you had to prepare your budget to be operational. So yes, I am uh, very familiar with the budget. Um, funding, that is another asset I can say that I understand funding, but we can't always depend on whether or not there's going to be state or federal government because of the economy and what the city was receiving from the federal, it comes all the way down and like they say, it's a trickle down effect. When there's a problem in Washington with the federal budget, it goes to the state, and when they're, the governors say we're cutting back, so it cuts down on the city. So everything is not always in black and white that it looks clear or it's on paper, but trying to stay operational or within that budget, and I'm listening about we can increase different fees. Well, when you look at the workforce and the seniors, everybody cannot afford an increase. Even when it came to our utilities, we have to have utilities, but at the same time, we can't keep raising the water. Uh, we're, we're a city. We're not Ohio Edison. We're not Columbia Gas. You can't keep raising those kinds of uh, fees, especially if you're trying to maintain the house, keep your electric on, keep your water on, um, then you're trying to feed the family, keep your roof on. It's, it's get crazy, but we have to find another solution on funding. And basically, the, the city about to tapped out on fees. So, I mean, I just had a fundraiser, $100. So the parks is something, you know, that they raise, the, the parking fees. And if you're downtown and the meter's not working, you're instead of putting money in there. So 
that money does generate, but it's not enough to keep the city operational. Not on small fees like that. Uh, this kind of a uh, kind of pulls off for of the first question we had at the beginning. But as council members, new and old, uh, you'll be faced with voting for things that are both for and against your party lines. How do you feel about voting against your party lines, and how will you represent your constituents if the majority of their opinions prove different than your own? Excellent question. Um, I don't care about the party line, frankly. You know, if, if, you, if you're holding this job, city council at large, you're doing, you're in that job to help all the people, all the people, regardless of party, regardless of the part of town they live in. And the people in the North End deserve the same consideration as the people in the South End. You know, we're all God's children, look at it that way. But, you know, uh, there, yes, there's talk about, you, know, you really should vote this way and support the party. But you know what? The common denominator to all this activity is people. We're here to serve the people. We're not here to serve the Democrats, or we're not here to serve the Republicans. We're here to serve the citizens of Mansfield. Flat out, that's it. That's the common denominator. That's our job. That's what we're here to do. And the state. Thank you very much. I couldn't agree more. I think that you know decisions are tough to make at times, and I think that you look at a majority determination and you make your decision based upon that. Um, party lines are not always applicable when you're thinking about human-based decisions and what is important to the community that you're serving. So, um, again, I would agree with Cliff. You know. The decision that needs to be made is not relevant to what a party line. I sometimes honestly wonder why we even have on <laughs> party lines when when you go in to vote for the candidate at the polls coming this November the fifth. I think it should really the candidate should stand on his own instead of a party. But it is a democracy. It's a good thing. You have to have your checks and balances, so I accept that. But once the uh, once the votes have been tallied, that's it. I'm in it for the third ward. I'm just one little small vote on city council, but I can be a big mouth if I got a problem with the issues. <laughs> it's really simple. So that's where it should stop. And I I, I agree, and I, I would uh, it would really sad me for any candidate. Although we do see it today, it does happen. If you're not a Democrat, that if you're not a Republican, that no, it stops when the when the polls close on November the fifth. Thank you. Well, as I stated before, once you're elected and you're sitting on council, the issue before you is what's important. What is the issue? What is the best? And and as you think about how you're going to vote for it, I don't believe anyone there's thinking about a party. They're thinking about what's best for the citizen and the issue before them. Thank you. Party line. <clears throat> As a young lady being raised in the South, there was no such thing as party line. You went when you were at the point where voting was allowed. You went to vote for the person that was going to best serve the community. I still feel that way today. Uh, if that person is qualified to deal with the issue for the entire city, not just the north end, the south end, the east end, the west end, we are all the same individuals. I don't care if we live in and over on Crystal Springs or in the Woodland area. We still are affected by the same property taxes, even though some taxes is higher than the other side of town, but at the same time, when it, the bottom line is we're residents of this city and we need a person or persons to do the right thing. And whatever it takes to get this city back on track, being Democrat, Republican, Independent, it's just doing the right things for 
all citizens, not just a few, but all citizens. So I don't have a problem with that. I just want to be represented to the fullest, 100%. With one of the issues that, that faces the city, uh, this question comes to mind with the safety being a major factor in a community of this size. What is your position on the current level of funding supporting our public uh, safety forces? And what, if anything, uh, would you change if given the chance to do so? Would you restate that question? The funding for the safety forces? With, with the, yeah, with the uh, safety being a major factor, uh, what is your position on the current level of funding supporting our public safety forces? And what, if anything, would you change if given the chance to do so? Well, technically, when it comes to our safety forces, which is fire and police, and for us currently funding, that all depends on what that falls upon. Uh, whether it's the, the fire department, they may uh, apply for extra grants to keep their um, staffing levels up. The police may do the same thing. But most of that funding that they, that falls up under the safety forces, most of that is contract negotiation, which you can't do anything about. Uh, once it is mandated that this is their level entry, whether it's salary or their vacation days, sick days. Uh, if you don't know anything about the safety forces, most of those guys are under mandated contracts. So technically, uh, I would have to say it would have to stay as it current, currently, um, the ordinance or in place for that. So there's nothing you can actually do about that. Just to clarify, this could also include equipment or, or any other things that they may need as well. Just to re clarify that. Okay, thank you. Uh, for their equipment, I think the city is in a good place at this point in time um, when it comes to cruisers and uh, fire equipment. Um, I think we're very well protected at this point. If it's not broke, don't fix it. <laughs> well, we certainly, we, we need our safety forces, no doubt about it. Um, recently, I believe the fire department got a large size grant to, to make a, a purchase. Uh, again, the grants have been a blessing to the city, but there's so much because when you said, what can you do? There is, there's the union to consider, so there's some things you can't do. Uh, they're, they're in, they have contracts, and, but we do need them. Uh, if you call 911 or if you call someone, whether it's the fire department or whether it's a situation where you need an officer, you want them to respond and you look for them to respond. So I'm all for the safety forces and whatever we can do to make sure they have uh, what's needed because for a city to be truly successful, they need to have a good safety force. That's my opinion. I am concerned about the safety forces. I do sincerely believe the numbers are low. Dangerously low? Well, maybe not. But then you don't want to burn your people out either. And the people have to have the tools to do the job. And there are some concerns there, yes. But the city's budget is not much different than mine or yours. It's just got more zeros and a few more commas in front of them. You can only pay for so much with what you got. So it is a concern. We have a tax issue coming up here in the near future. It's a hot topic today. It's a very hot topic, and I know it. We'll see what the citizens want to do. We can only do so much with what we have. Well, with what they have, I'm not there yet. <laughs> I do understand the budget. Thank you. I think safety forces are of utmost importance to our city and our community. I think that um, the safety forces should be commended for what they've been able to do, um, considering 
the finances currently. Uh, I would be supportive of any and all grants that could be obtained uh, as long as they were union allowed. Um, I think that if there is a possibility to strengthen the safety forces, that that should be a priority for the administration. And I would support uh, any and all uh, opportunities that would arise to continue to strengthen them through grants. I am aware that there is a price tax that will be on the ballot in November. Um, a portion of that is to set to go to the safety forces if it does pass, and uh, I hope that it does because I do think that um, there is some concern that maybe there is not enough of a safety force presence in the city of Mansfield, and I do think that uh, we could increase that. The question was, what's my position on funding uh, in terms of personnel and equipment? I have to say I couldn't disagree more with the statement my opponent made. Two of the statements were, there's nothing you can actually do regarding funding, and the other was, we're very well protected at this point. Ladies and gentlemen, based on the Committee for a Safer Mansfield, emergency services need 78 additional employees to reach their fully authorized levels. There's a lot we can do. As you also heard, we have the pride tax coming up. 50% of that tax is earmarked for the safety forces, designed to generate $1.65 million and hire 33 police officers and 17 firefighters. So yes, there is something we can do. And I think we need to get behind that and staff it. That's action each of us as citizens can take. I think it's important. I mentioned earlier that if you're not safe, nothing else matters. That's what I think we can do, and that's what I think we must do. I think at this time uh, we have some questions that were submitted from the audience. And, uh, if you want to present them, we're going to be here. Before we go into the questions, I was, I, do you all, does anyone else have, okay, I'll come get yours, I'm mm -hmm. sorry, Ms. Cole. Um, I wanted to just, I was supposed to announce everyone else that was doing stuff in the room, and I forgot. Jean Taddy is our timekeeper. They all know her. She's back there holding up the card yes. for them. The room is so good. I haven't had to put that red card on. <laughs> <laughs> Myrna Simons. Simons, right? Yes. Okay. From, she is from the uh, Med Central Neighborhood Black Watch, and she is helping screen questions. And we're just trying to make sure that the questions we give them are not repetitive. If they were not repetitive, then they, they are here. Um, Tony Chinney is our Community Development Coordinator for NECIC. He is filming this. Um, Sue Warren from Catholic Charities at the back is who signed you in. And there's also a piece of information that is from our regular Citizen Action Meeting that was prepared by the Law Director's Office and Cheryl Wesselman is um, here with us and she is an Assistant Law Director. And she's a regular attendee and keeps us updated on which of these houses are coming down and which houses we want coming down. So I just wanted to acknowledge those people. I'm very sorry um, if I did not. And now, he's got the last one. As we move into this, uh, one of the questions is, and uh, mm -hmm. I think this time we'll probably start. Uh, we'll start here on, on uh, Cynthia's side here. Would you support citywide trash pickup, and why or why not? Would I support citywide trash pickup? Yes, I would support citywide trash pickup. We've had it in the past, but is this going to be cost effective for the city? Is it going to be cost effective for the homeowner or the tenant? Uh, how much will it take away from the budget? When it comes, we've been down this road before, we've had city pickup. So it all depends on how that can be worked in the budget. Would it be economical uh, and advantage for the city? Uh, it all depends. Oh, well, um, I think it's a great idea, but there's a lot of things to consider. Uh, one of the things about city, uh, <coughs> Pick up, there would be jobs that would be added to the city. But then again, uh, how about the businesses that are out there picking up already? I mean, what will happen with them? So there's a lot to consider before 
sometimes it's hard to say yes and no and just give a direct answer. There's a lot of things to consider, so you do need to think about all the things involved in it. Thank you. I remember when the city used to pick up trash back many years ago. I know back when I started with the city. And it was a part of the enterprise fund. Uh, it, wasn't, it didn't fall under, I don't believe it fell under tax money. It should have been an enterprise fund, I would imagine. But for some reason, the city wasn't very good at it. And I don't know, just an old story. I, I don't know the particulars. I just, and they decided to get out of it for whatever reason. I don't know. It wasn't economical or feasible. Well, I don't know. And I, it wasn't. And I, I, can, I can see the concerns. Been there, done that. Maybe leave it alone. Leave it alone. Because of the other people that you would affect. If all of a sudden the city says, okay, we're taking over. We're coming in and we're doing it again. I don't know. I'd have to really look at that one. Thank you. Um, I think that having heard of this issue earlier this week, um, I think that the question really lies back into the blight issue. And um, does it make sense for the city to manage that? I'm not sure. I, you know, I would really have to look at the numbers to do cost benefit analysis to see that it made sense. But I think what has happened is when the city released its duty in collecting trash, um, the assumption was made that homeowners or property owners would then remove trash on their own. And what we have seen now is that, that is not happening. Um, or we have found that there are people who are collecting trash who are maybe not dumping it in appropriate places or taking advantage of other people with commercial enterprises and dumping it at those places in an inappropriate <coughs> fashion. So I do think um, going back to kind of this codes and permits issue, that it does make sense for the city to look closely at what is happening with the trash. What does that mean that the city should be managing the trash service? Maybe not so much, but I do think that it does make sense for those individuals who are uh, misappropriating the opportunity to have that choice to get rid of their own trash, they should be penalized because it is not um, the responsibility of all of us to take care of those individuals who don't want to take care of themselves. As a city council person and one who's entrusted with the needs of the people, if the citizens come forth with a compelling reason why we really need to do this, then I think we really need to do this. But in my opinion, a resounding no, for a variety of reasons, so let me tell you what they are. First of all, you've got, I'm a businessman, you have a huge investment of dollars. Can you imagine what a garbage truck costs and how many of them we're going to need to buy? Where are we going to do that kind of money? So you've got a huge investment you have to make initially. That's number one. Number two, I don't think the timing's right right now. Based on the city being in financial emergency, now's not the time when you want to extend the services that you're offering. Number three is, I was born in Toledo. One of the reasons I left Toledo is because they had citywide garbage collection, and they had problems up there, and when they, they ran into budget problems, you know the first thing to go? Garbage collection. The place was a mess. Toledo was awful. You, know, you don't want to do that. I've been there. I've seen it. I've been in that movie. I don't think we want to go there. Uh, another issue that was brought up is that who's going to be the person to tell the business owners, sorry, the city, the city shut me down. You're out of work. Find something else to do. I don't want to be the person to do that. That's just not good. And again, I'm a business person. I get a good rate. You know why I get a good rate? Because right now it's competitive. You've got people bidding for your for your for your business for your services. You know, how many of us get little flyers or something in the mail? I'll I'll do it for this much. I'll do it for this much. You know, you can shop around. You can compare, and it saves you money, and it forces the business owners uh, to be lean. So for all those reasons. Personally, I say a resounding no. If I could just add one sort of out of order comment. I invite everyone to come to our citizen action meetings and get some more depth of discussion about um, even, and Tracy could tell you some of the research of other communities of comparable size that it is possible to contract that out and it didn't necessarily warrant the city buying any trucks at all and, and putting anybody out of business because they could bid you know, for chunks of the community. And, and more will be discussed at future citizen action meetings. I have a question here from the audience, and it reads, 
The minority community is disproportionately affected in the areas of crime, housing, health, employment, and education. How will you educate yourself on these issues, and how will you help? We can start with you, Mr. Mears. Um, I told you I'm a business person, and my priority is to bring business here. Uh, that's what I, you know, I, you don't get to be an accounting supervisor with a Fortune 100 company unless you know a little bit about how money is made. Uh, I think council deserves to have a business person with some financial savvy. I think to give it a diversity of, uh, of experience and education. So I think that, that warrants, you know, me being on council and helping uh, the community and the minority community and providing more opportunities. I told you one of my, one of my, my priorities is to pro provide so many opportunities that our kids won't leave so that they can pick and choose what they want to do. You know, I've worked with so many people that were here many years ago, and they told me stories, well, you know, I had an argument with my supervisor at lunch, so heck, I went down to the steel mill and they hired me that afternoon. Uh, or I had, a, you know, I had an argument with my, my supervisor at Tappan, and I went to GM, and I worked that afternoon. You know, that's the kind of environment that used to be here, and wouldn't it be great to have that again? And I really think we can do that. And one of the reasons I told you that I think we can do that is because, you know, we, we have a lot of we have a lot of, a lot of resources. I told you, uh, in terms of distribution and, and logistics, you know, that lends itself to manufacturers coming here because they can easily, in a cost-effective manner, get their goods to the market. You know, that's been proven, and it's in trade journals. And, and uh, you know, even though we're not number one as we were in 2007. Uh, my recent research shows we're still in the top ten. We like we have a lot of resources and, and uh, uh, infrastructure that we can optimize. So how does that affect the? Uh, how does that impact the minority community? Well, because when we get those opportunities, we're going to have to educate people for those uh, opportunities, and so there'll be a greater emphasis on education. I'm, boy, I'm a big proponent of education. I've been teaching at least part time. Uh, well, I should tell you since 1975. That really dates me. But you know, education is very important. Manufacturing is very important. Jobs are very important, and those are the things that we, we need to do. And with me on council, you know, I can facilitate those issues because of my background. Uh, I appreciate that. Thanks. Well, I couldn't agree more. I think that um, the social service aspect to community development is hugely important. Um, I recently uh, learned of um, Richie's Market closing and the addition of the Dollar General stores. Um, and I think that. I'm very saddened by that. Um, I think that um, we're not looking closely enough at the needs of each individual community and the neighborhoods within our community and what those social service issues are and how those social service issues impact economic and positive growth development. Um, over the years, I've been able to witness a number of collaborations. One collaboration in particular I found most fascinating was a collaboration between Catholic Charities the city of Mansfield in Richland County. Um, Rebecca Owens in the back, um, she was uh, very instrumental in providing a financial education component um, that participated with housing in the city and getting individuals who may not have knowledge of how uh, finance impacts long-term decisions and foreclosure and marketing and owning homes and owning properties. And I think that um, it's up to us to continue to engage leaders of social service organizations and bridge the gap between social service, community development, and economic development because one piece is equally as important as the other. We could have as many uh, high paying jobs as, as possible, but if we still have uh, systemic social service based issues in certain communities and those issues are not addressed, it, it doesn't matter what the jobs are going to By all means, jobs and opportunity, opportunity for all. <clears throat> we keep hearing every, every now and then, you know, every so often, not mentioning any names like Spitzer's moved to Ontario, and then there's some other businesses, they just, opportunities just, and jobs just kind of keep leaving the area. I would like to think that Mansfield, with this economic downturn has bottomed out and now we have an opportunity to get our way out. For years we have heard that the airport is a sleeping giant. It's a great place for 
business and what have you, and then we got the 71 and the 30 and, you know, all the roads and what have you. And I know, I know past administrations have worked hard with the land out here and the different businesses out at the airport and what have you. But I think it all just comes down to job and opportunities. Thank you. <laughs> the minority community mm -hmm. in the areas of crime, housing, health, employment, and education. Mm -hmm. Housing, health, employment, and education. <laughs> I know, I just left about four of them. <laughs> <laughs> so that's two more minutes. <laughs> You know what, uh, communication, and that's what I say is the best thing. I don't think we communicate enough. We don't get a chance to know one another. We have assumptions, we assume this one's doing this. We make assumptions about each other and say, and we uh, uh, sort of, uh, our opinion is, well, this is what happened before, and they're gonna do this. So I, I think it's, uh, I'll have to be honest with you, and you said it's a great um, foundation. And, and I'm not saying that because we're here. I, I'm really not because I've said it before. But you have to have a place to start. You have to have a foundation to build on. And so if you can find a place where you can build on where all these problems can be addressed, are there problems? Absolutely. I have a problem that even now you go to fill out something, they want to know the ethnicity or whatever. Sometimes I wonder why they want to know that. Uh, in regard to, to crime, um, I always say that's an individual thing. I don't know what all the what the problem might have been or why the person committed. I, it's it's something that you, it's hard to lump together. Some of these questions are hard to answer. It's more of an individual thing where you can go and talk. But communications and talking and listening and having a place that you can go to, and um, I, I believe. Um, I like they say jobs is one and, and training, but I believe we need to have a, a sounding board, so to speak. There's a lot of people that need to be heard that aren't being heard. Uh, uh, they will tell me things or somebody else things, but they need to be heard. So I think uh, in regard to a lot of the things in the minority, they need to be heard. And I guess I can add to that. It's easy for someone else to say or ask a question about job minority, the disproportion when it comes to the crime, the housing, unless you are physically there. Uh, when it comes to jobs, we don't have to wait till election time to know that there's a problem with min minority getting jobs in the city. You know, with the factories are closing, you know, Western House is gone, Tappan is gone, uh, you have the steel workers here, General Motors is gone. So a lot of those jobs that used to pay that you could just walk in, uh, put in an application for a job, well, those days are gone, and I understand that. But at the same time, yes, we do need to train, but we need to get the word out. We need to publicize, we need to advertise. I don't expect someone from General Motors who's been a, a tool and die person to go out to Newman Technology and pick up their technical part without training. You can't go from one place to the next without training. But we need to advertise these jobs. We need to work with organization we need to work with neighborhood we need to work with the schools i mean we used to have what they call a trade <coughs> group here years ago that you can go to the aflcio or the auto workers and put your name in a hopper and you know once something came up then you could apply for these jobs where somewhere along the line once the jobs start fading and leaving mansfield uh, the minorities were the last one to get called, and still is, because of the lack of training. We need to organize and start training so people can work. When it comes to the housing, 
the worst housing is in the minority areas. I mean, we can't sit up here and whitewash this and say it's not, but we need to train our kids, our next door neighbors. You know, if you got a problem, we need to take care of it. Don't wait till the house falls apart before you call the city or the health department because somebody's water been running and you got a problem. We need to, like Pat said, there needs to be a central location. We can only do so much at the city, but as organization and groups, when one person can help you, then it should be another organization that should be able to step in. Helping hands, they used to be around, but they don't exist anymore. Not that I'm aware of. Uh, one of the next questions here is, do you believe that stronger code enforcement is the key to eliminate blight? Stronger codes? Um, we have codes on the books now, but without the proper staff to enforce these codes. When I started at the city, at one time they had probably six or seven guys down there in codes and permits, maybe more than that, that were inspectors. Now you only have two. And to have stronger codes when there's nobody to get out there and really work to get a city this side, uh, it's kind of hard. Um, at the same time, we as taxpayers need to step up and say, if my house is falling down and I need some paint, I can take, if you can afford it, set aside money, buy a couple gallons of paint. It used to be what we had the neighborhood <coughs> coalition group years ago. If you had a problem, there was an organization that you could go and ask and they would give you paint to paint your house. But now we as property owners, we need to take some kind of responsibility to maintain our property. There needs to be, yes, uh, property maintenance. I mean, some things we have to take the responsibility to step up and do ourselves. But to enforce and stricter codes, uh, you still gonna have a large percentage of people who not gonna take care of their property. You can find them, you can send letters, you can threaten them, but maybe it'll work, maybe it won't, but uh, at this point in time, um, with the level of enforcers there, you know, I don't know what's the answer to that, besides try to work with people. <laughs> That's a load of gun. <laughs> it really is. It's a load of gun. <laughs> because I, I believe, uh, it wasn't too long ago, uh, we, we tried to give the codes and permits department more teeth. We did raise uh, a few of the rates, but the problem is, no matter what, will people obey them? And, the, and, and we're finding out, yes, we do have a lot of codes and different, but we still have a lot of people that are not obeying them because the codes and the permits department is down uh, employees. It's hard to enforce some of the things. Uh, even with the contractors, I think they even, we did something with codes with contractors. But it's, it's really difficult to enforce some of the things and that's where we do get a lot of telephone calls from. This person is doing this, or this neighbor is doing that, or they're, they're, uh, uh, this trash is there. But do we need tougher codes? I think the ones we have on the book, maybe, um, if I'm not mistaken, they were just, the charter was just reviewed not too long ago, and I believe everything uh, was passed. It just has to be, um, Enforce. I, I don't think it's that we need stricter codes. I think they need to be enforced. And I totally agree with that comment. We got enough laws on the book when it comes to the housing codes and permits. There's plenty there. 
and uh, I, I know there was an effort here not too long ago to get it a little more up to date and what have you, but you don't have the personnel that you had six, seven, eight years ago. I know I was one that got caught in a construction project a couple times by them. They just don't have that time anymore. Uh, give them more teeth, stiffer fines, what have you. Well, I'm sure they're there. You just have to enforce it once again. They're low on personnel to begin with, so I don't know. I think the laws exist. I think they're good. It's just getting out there and taking care of them. Thank you. I do agree that the laws on the books are adequate. Um, I also agree that there is not enough um, enforcers out there to be able to enforce, especially with the population of this size. Um, I think that going back to one of the initiatives that was brought out of this uh, committee to have that streamlined approach to identifying problems and then kind of bird dogging them through the system would could be a, a very applicable solution because you are empowering organizations that are already intimately familiar with the problems in these neighborhoods and um, allowing those individuals to be able to target and then follow these issues through the administration could essentially help the administration in a, in a very low cost effort. Um, you're not taking away the responsibility of the city of Mansfield to enforce the issue but you're allowing the city of Mansfield to have additional eyes on the street in identifying those problems and seeing that those problems are rectified. Thank you. A few moments ago I mentioned how much I disagreed with my opponent, but in this case I couldn't agree more. Um, stronger code enforcement is really not practical. So I suppose I agree with most people here. Uh, because of the lack of personnel that we we just don't have the people. We don't have the teeth. We don't have the strength. We don't have the inspectors. We don't have the money. In a perfect world, we'd have those resources available to us, and we would do that. But frankly, we don't. So we look for other solutions. The NECIC, I think, has come a long way uh, with processes and programs like the tool shed that they have. I think that's incredible. They have that many rakes and mowers and weed eaters and, and the tools that people need. You know, when when perhaps. They want to do the work, but they don't have a mower. They don't have a rake. They don't have the tools. Um, they can come down here, check them out, and, and you know, take matters into their own hands and, and help their own neighborhood themselves. They're, they're, they're self-empowering themselves, which, is, which I think is an outstanding idea. Um, I think you know what something that was brought out in, in the, the blight video was accountability. You know, there's a portion of the key there. Uh, if you can find the landowners be it a bank or an individual or a company, and make them accountable to cut the grass, to maintain the property, to take down the dead trees, to remove the hazards. Yes, you want to do that, when that's possible. Um, but barring that, you know, uh, if you have to have a city assessment or a county assessment and assess it against their taxes, that only facilitates the land bank process, whereas these, these uh, properties that have so much assessments against them make it prime land bank uh, potential for the neighbors to acquire those properties. So I think that process is, is really what we need to follow as opposed to stronger enforcement, which really isn't practical at this point with the city uh, finances being what they are. Thank you. Okay, I have another question here from the audience. I actually have two that I'm going to combine for the sake of time. And the question for the candidates is, what is your action plan to improve your particular ward and engage your citizens and what is your plan to keep the citizens of Mansfield updated on city activities? We can start with Ms. City Baker. My action plan is to be a voice for all citizens. Um, how am I going to put this into action? My plans are to be a partnership organization, me being the, the person on city council, reaching out to organization as a partnership. Uh, I work for the citizens. I want to be accessible, available, and accountable whenever you need me. I'm not going to be the one that you say, well, okay, you will see me once a month or twice a month at city council. 
No, I plan on being very visible when it comes to neighborhood watch organizations, uh, community groups. That's how I will be engaged with the citizen of the city. Uh, so much is going on right now. You need someone that can be there for you. Someone you can pick up the phone and say, well, Cindy, I got a problem. You shouldn't have to wait 24 hours to get a hold of me or the next day. I will be there. Um, keeping the citizen updated with everything that's going on, uh, that's not a problem. Because like I say, once you're in the neighborhood, you can talk to people. I will return your phone calls. I will be available. Uh, whenever there's a problem, you need to be updated. We don't have to wait 48 hours. I will get back with you within the hour. Now, if there's an emergency, then we have to work on that. Because like I say, nothing can get done, you know, with the snap of a finger or in some time within five or 10 minutes or even an hour. But I will keep you, the citizen, updated on any problems. I guess my action plan is just what I've been doing. Uh, I'm not trying to be funny, but uh, to be available, to listen to people, and to do what I can do, because that's what I've always wanted to do. If there's a problem and I can help or put you in contact with the right person, <coughs> then that's what I would like to do. And to go drink a lot more coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Simply be available. Uh, there's nothing unreasonable. Any question deserves an answer, and I have the time to look. If I don't have the answer, I have the time to research it and find the answer. So it's just real simple. Be a full-time counselor. I will be available and get back with the people in the third floor. I would too be a, sorry. <laughs> I would too be available and continue to strengthen the positives of the third ward. Um, I think that our answers are within the ward. I think that, you know, we've got a lot of strengths. The neighborhood itself is uh, a desirable place to live. It's close in proximity to our city center. There's schools. It's a walkable neighborhood for the most part. Um, I think that um, as far as communicating progress, that can happen in a variety of ways. Face-to-face, um, door-to-door, neighborhood watch, um, as well as utilizing social media tools if uh, those would be uh, important to the constituents in that ward. I've got all these ideas from what the people have been saying. So it's great to be last. <laughs> the question was two part. Uh, what's my action plan to improve my ward? Well, I'm at large, so I have a little city. Right? Um, and how do I how do I update the citizens on uh, activities within the city? So for the first part, um, the action plan to improve the city. Let, let me tell you what I've done. You, know, I, I told you that the Mansfield is really ripe for opportunity, based on manufacturing, distribution, logistics, and basically. Uh, companies getting their, their products to market. Uh, what I've done so far in the last year, I've uh, sponsored 26 pieces of legislation. Seven of them are to improve our streets, roads, and bridges. Some are repaving, some are potholes. So again, that's in line with uh, what I mentioned earlier, that our roads, our bridges, our airport, our rail service, and our proximity to populations and, and major uh, automobile thoroughfares really make us an excellent place to locate a business. So those are you know some of the things that I've done in terms of the legislation that, that uh, has been sponsored and, and already approved, by the way. Uh, but I did say my number one priority was safety. Uh, again, we did swear in uh, five new police officers uh, last month, so we're on our way. You know, we're far short of the authorized levels for fire and police. Uh, we'll see what comes of the levy. We're doing what we can with the resources that we have. Um, but we do, again, I've said it a couple of times, but nothing matters if you're not safe. Uh, making the, the city more business friendly uh, is imperative, you know, and, and it's not just in terms of opportunity, but I sponsored legislation uh, which was, was passed by council to plant 168 trees in the north end between Route 30 and the downtown area. Now, why do we do that? Because, you know what, that's one of the major thoroughfares. That's one of the first impressions that people have when they get off 30. What are they going to see? Trees look good. 168 of them in that short area, and that's done by the Shade Tree Commission. Hats off to those folks. Um, 
In terms of updating uh, the citizens on city activity, uh, I've been to numerous neighborhood watch uh, organizations, and, and I hear, you know, again, I'm, we need to be facilitators, we need to be the conduits of what, what people's concerns are, but also inform them, make it a bilateral conversation. Here's what's going on in the city, here's what you know, we've done so far to address the problems you're talking about. Um, we have to be visible, we have to be approachable. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was on the phone last night following up on an issue that an individual had. Uh, he was concerned, he, he had gone to church and he heard about a cemetery in which uh, an individual was offended by a cross on a tombstone and so the cemetery owners were going to remove the cross. He was very upset about that. So I talked to his, uh, his uh, pastor and really kind of got the story. And he actually he had the facts wrong a little bit. But, it, uh, but he was very concerned about it. He was very upset. And so uh, in my conversation with him last, last night, he said, you know, I need to get more involved. How can I do that? And I suggested, come to city council, come to Neighborhood Watch, do what you're doing now. I'll keep you informed as best I can. Thank you very much. He said six o'clock. <laughs> These guys are going to be so glad. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Can we give our candidates a round? <laughs> I want to thank all of you so much for this was a grueling. I was moving around the room so I could look at everybody and no one wants to be in this seat. So <laughs> thank you all very much. You handled yourselves beautifully and you did answer our questions. And so I thank you all very much. And I want to really thank all of you for coming because I think that this is the first step in citizen action. And first of all, let's know who we elect. Let's know what they stand for. Let's go vote. So thank you very much. And to the committee, um, I thank you. And then one brief piece of business. Sharon, this is our part of our regular citizen action stuff. <laughs> um, I wanted to just announce to you, I want to ask all of you to come back next month, second Wednesday. We're going to have, uh, we're intending to have all of our levy candidates, uh, all of our levy ballot issues uh, representatives here, and also we're hoping to get our school board. Um, we know that we're talking about neighborhoods, so we don't divide it up. We live here. We work here, we play here, we go to school here. So we want to make sure that as citizens we're engaging at all those different levels. Um, Sharon was gracious enough to prepare. Thank you. This was for this month's meeting. This is one of the things. Um, one of the things that we do here, at, and we are constantly being educated by our city officials. So um, Sharon is a regular person, as I said, and. So she provided us with this handout that you got, which is legislation basics, who can request, and those kinds of things. And those are things that, as a committee, we have run into as we were trying to work forward with the, um, the central intake project that's been mentioned and so forth. So thank you for the clarification. Do you have any, you want to say anything? Uh, I hope it's to be self-explanatory. If anyone has any questions, please contact the lot or there's a question. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Yeah, my question was an answer that I Oh, your question. Okay. okay, we just ran out and I said it's 6 o'clock, but I will. We have one minute. Why is... Oh, I'm not going to answer that. I'm not asking that part. After he's done, I mean, after they're done answering this, we will adjourn. Thank you. But yes, we'll go ahead and okay. With Having knowledge of this, I. it's kind of because I've heard of so many times at different neighborhood watch meetings, so in some ways I can even answer it. But one of the things is, why is the response to the north end area so slow? And then she gives a, a description of what happened in her instance where she made seven calls to a non-emergency number that took a considerable amount of time and basically her problem wasn't solved until she actually got involved and did the legwork and provided pictures and, and that type of thing. I guess in your your question would be more on the side of how would they how is how would council how would you see council being involved in that process I guess is you want me to answer uh, well I'm just trying to get a little feedback <laughs> yeah, here just so that we kind of because I I know why myself but I, I want you know how do you want them to answer that would you like to I mean you can uh, all right Cliff if you want to I'd be glad to respond to that. Um, I'm not being familiar with the problem, but it sounds like you went to city departments yourself and 
you tried to get an answer. Did, right. did you try your council representative or your large person? My council person is, is Pat Hightower, and I didn't call her because her husband is sick. I see. So I didn't call her. But I contacted the police and everybody else that I could, and I even have pictures for the problem that could have been solved in an hour. Okay. My suggestion is, again, as I mentioned earlier, I see city council, and particularly at large, as your conduit, as your mouthpiece. You know, if you can't get satisfaction, get a hold of me. Uh, get a hold of Alan Heron. We're both at large, and let us do the legwork for you, and let us get satisfaction for you. That's what we're here for. Okay. Well, I think Thank you all very much. Please take the food. We didn't know if we were here for five people or minutes.